Folks, we are destroying a MAGA narrative in this one. This is breaking, and I need your help because as we speak, MAGA, the Trumpers, they are trying to shut us down so that we can't bring the truth to you. And as a group, me and you, we can't bring the truth to everybody else in the world. So hit that like and subscribe button. Watch this before it's too late because we are crushing Trump's biggest narrative tonight because he is the biggest loser tonight. No one else lost bigger than him, and likely no one won bigger in many ways than Joe Biden, because Donald Trump is demonstrating that his party is fractured, whereas everyone around Biden is uniting in pointing out the dangers of Donald Trump. Democrats are united on that front. They are more united than Republicans. Nothing's perfect. There's a lot of protest in the party about foreign policy, not without reason, but they are much more united. And tonight, it's been exposed with Trump collapsing, collapsing into his dementia and Haley supporters and everybody else noting it. I have a bunch of clips to show you about Trump's massive defeat, Democrats destroying him in brutal interviews, and critically, Biden scoring a big win by directly targeting a crucial part of the Trump base. But critically, we need to see that Haley voters know Donald Trump is a demented freak. And they are backing away harder than before. And it says here, warning signs for Trump in the general per exits. In North Carolina, two-thirds, 66% of Haley voters say Trump is not physically or mentally fit to be president. And 81% of Haley voters say they are not an automatic vote for him. Now, of course, some of those 81 will ultimately end up voting for him. But in states like North Carolina, you don't need a big chunk of Haley voters to dip away for it to change. That is kryptonite. That is cyanide for Donald Trump. And it gets so much worse in these clips. But wait for the end, because Joe Biden knocked the F out of Donald Trump tonight. And you're not going to forget it former Democratic presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren of the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thanks so much for being here, Senator. So Donald Trump's pretty close to winning the Republican yeah. uh, nomination to get enough delegates to, to clinch it, despite what happened January 6th, yeah. 91 criminal counts, yeah. being found liable of sex abuse yeah. uh, and defamation. Despite all of that, this, this race has not really been competitive on the Republican side. What do you make, it's two-parter for you, Professor, what do you make of, A, the fact that uh, Donald Trump does seem to have this clinched up and has the whole time. And B, that even with all those vulnerabilities, it's competitive, if not Trump in the lead against Biden. So let's do the first part. Donald Trump's supporters are Donald Trump's supporters. You know, ask them. They still, many of them are election deniers. They're in with Donald Trump all the way. But here's the part that I think is really important. Donald Trump really hasn't done anything in the last three years to try to expand the number of people to join the Trump family. And I think what this is gonna come down to is gonna just be a comparison. We're already there. And we're gonna have two people who both have been president and who will have records to run on. So Donald Trump, basically four years as president, did two things. One, he got an extremist Supreme Court that overturned Roe versus Wade. And two, he got the biggest tax cut in a zillion years, two trillion dollars mostly sucked up by millionaires, billionaires, and giant corporations. Joe Biden, in three years, has managed to cut costs for working families. So now there's $35 insulin. Four million people have seen their student loan debt canceled. Um, and he has also brought more fairness to the tax code. First time, we have a 15% minimum corporate tax on these billionaire corporations and largest uh, climate package in the history of the world. So I think what they've done is going to be a big part, certainly not all of it, but a big part of how this election is going to shape up. Senator, one of the things you just said was that Donald Trump hasn't done anything to expand his base or his electorate. Um, what they are trying to do in the Trump campaign is very much encroach on traditionally Democratic voters, black voters, Hispanic voters. Um, some of the things that you just said are the arguments that, of course, we expect the Biden campaign to make going forward. There is some frustration in Democratic quarters that those kinds of arguments aren't coming more um, specifically and loudly from the president himself. 
So I think what you're saying is the president needs to brag more. I'm asking you. I, well, I think he should brag more. I think he's got plenty to brag about. Thursday's going to be the State of the Union. I hope he does a lot of bragging. I also hope that he talks about the things he wants to do, like universal child care and housing, the things we need to work on. But here's the thing I think most of all. I hope that what we're going to see is just Joe Biden being Joe Biden. Because Joe Biden ultimately has got a good heart. I know who Joe Biden fights for. Joe Biden gets out there every day and fights for people like the diabetic who has gone from paying $200 a month to $35 a month, for the person getting crushed by student loan debt, the public school teacher who just can't pay off those debts. He's out there fighting for those people. He's fighting for people who wanted a job and now have got a job. That's Joe Biden. Trump, who does he fight for? Donald Trump, so, first and last. Joining us now is uh, House Democratic Leader Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of New York. Congressman, how are you doing tonight? Good evening. Great to be with you. What are you looking for on a night like this? Or do you not even have the TV on except for when you're coming to the camera <laughs> to check in with us? Well, certainly it's interesting to see uh, that Donald Trump continues to march toward the Republican nomination. He is a clear and present danger to our democracy, to our way of life. Uh, to everyday Americans, and I think uh, on a night like this, the stakes continue to be crystallized that this is going to be a matchup in all likelihood between the former president and President Joe Biden. And I think that's a matchup once it's completely crystallized. Uh, the American people will understand that we can either move the country forward under the leadership of Joe Biden or risk turning back the clock under Donald Trump in a very dangerous way. There was some reporting uh, in the past week when Mitch McConnell announced that he'll be re retiring as uh, the Republican leader in the Senate, that he had told some people that it was the worst Congress he'd ever served in, which is saying something. Man's been in Congress a long time. Um, by any kind of metrics that we have, it's been one of the least productive Congresses, and it's been particularly true in the House. Even Chip Roy, a member of the Republican Party, has gotten up in the well and said, what exactly have we done? Do you think the, his the, the historically unproductive nature of this Congress has any political effect outside of what it does to governing? Do people, do voters know about it, care about it? Can you see it being part of this campaign as it was in 1948 for Harry Truman? Yeah, I do think it'll be uh, an important part of this campaign because you can establish a clear contrast. You have a do-nothing Republican Congress that has delivered no meaningful progress for the American people. Instead, it's been chaos and dysfunction and extremism. And that compares to the track record of accomplishment under the leadership of President Biden, a historic Congress uh, in the previous two years prior to this Congress starting, where we got things done like clean water in every community, bringing domestic manufacturing jobs back home to the United States of America, lowering the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs, including tracking the price of insulin to $35 a month for millions of Americans. It's an extraordinary track record of accomplishment. Now, we can contrast that with the do-nothing Republican Congress and also make clear that moving forward, President Biden has a vision for making life even better for the American people over the next four years. I want to ask you a question about your home state of New York and the congressional maps and delegation there. Um, the, the fate of who controls the House this fall hinges probably on no state more than it does on New York, uh, where four or five, five seats flipped. One just got flipped back with Tom Swazi. There are a number of high-level targets. There's been rounds of endless litigation about congressional maps. Finally, after a complicated set of uh, plot twists, uh, the Democrats have, have drawn a new map. Critics of it say it is, it is that basically they flinched, that it's nowhere near as aggressive as it should be, and that it risks essentially preserving a Republican majority. And I'm curious, as a New York Democrat, to get your response to that critique. Well, I strongly disagree. I think the New York State Legislature did a good job in drawing the fairest possible map that is a meaningful improvement on the map that had previously been drawn by an unelected out-of-town special master that broke up communities of interest and seemed to have been done in a way that provided a partisan political advantage to Republicans. Now, that said, it was under the current map not the new map that we will be running under in November, that Tom Swazi 
decisively defeated a Republican and basically swung the district by 15 points from the congressional election in 2022. Right. What's Haley going to do? <laughs> like, I mean, what, I mean you know, same thing she's been doing. Why stop? Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess that's right. I mean, I guess the money keeps rolling in, uh, right? If you can still continue to fundraise. Doesn't cost her anything to keep campaigning. She doesn't that's have right. another job. Nope. It's true. I mean, the point of I guess if you win a state, I mean, I guess I'm just sort of like running the math on the outcome here. Well, what are, what are the reasons to run for president? People run for president to win, be president to win the presidency. Yeah. People run for other reasons, yeah. too. Yeah. Right. I don't think that any of the third party candidates, for example, that we have ever had ever thought they were actually going to become president, except perhaps for Ross Perot and Teddy Roosevelt. But I mean, we're never going to you can't necessarily get into the mind here, but we can't see you, the effect of our candidacy. You know what? Which I just keeping legitimately like keeping trusted Republican voices about Donald Trump in the mix while Donald Trump runs for the presidency. I, I always think about this moment in the Dick Cheney biography uh, which, where it describes his first big job in government, which is which is chief of staff in the White House. Very, very young, Gerald Ford. And basically, there's this enormous vacuum that opens up, which is that all the Nixon people, you know, they get raptured. They get, they get thrown in jail. They get, and then all of a sudden, you got a government to run. And you need Republicans, and you need Republicans to run that government who don't, aren't Nixon people, because all the Nixon people are gone and discredited. And so a very young Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and a whole bunch of people come into this government and get their start in Republican politics then. And they, they do, they, you know, Cheney has, they have very powerful jobs above what they would normally have because of that. And I do wonder, like, there's always some possibility of the rapture with Donald Trump <laughs> of the thing of the thing just imploding. It never does happen. There's expectations for it happening, but there is some universe you can you can conjure. Not that it's not that difficult to conjure in which, say, a second defeat this time around really does like purge it from the party in some way or there because that is the tide that is pulling them. It's the tide that is pulling a lot of liberal democracies away from some of those core principles and has been the, the sort of wind at the back of right wing authoritarian and populist movements. And so how does Biden appeal to poorly educated voters? Yeah, or just voters without college edu college degrees, which might be well educated in other ways. You know, <laughs> I think people that feel very differently about how well the bargain of America is working for them, or how well the bargain of the global economy is working for them in the 21st century, because we've seen it in other countries. Right. And that's, I mean, again, that stuff matters a lot at the margins, right? Like five points, six points, seven points. That's the whole ballgame. But, but I would just say that I think the person who kn knows and would agree with you is, is so, Trump or maybe his his brain Bannon. I mean, that's why Biden was yes. a threat. That's why he got impeached the first time. Correct. Because Biden was the only one. Correct. That threatened that. And he figured out a special, I mean, he really did figure that out. And not only did he figure that out, he has clearly governed with that in mind. If yeah, you look yes. at where the investments have gone from the bipartisan infrastructure bill, from the CHIPS Act, and from the IRA, they have disproportionately gone to geographic areas that favor his opponent over him. But doesn't that, that favor mean Republican it's not politics. economics? That means it's well, something Well, that's the else. question, right? Like, it's not there's economics. a bet being made there. And the question is, can you make good on that bet from a policy and messaging standpoint against the pull of all these right. demographic trends that Steve is going to highlight in map after map after map tonight, or we will know before it even comes up what the map's going to look like based on that data. Yeah, the, the most repeated, most memorable talking point in detail that President Biden himself and the Democrats have talked about with the infrastructure bill is this is good jobs for people without college degrees. Yes. And if there's one thing they have said about that, it is that over and over again, and it's that dynamic at work exactly.